uh, kei raro i te maunga o Taranaki. Uh, ko te ati awa, Ngāti Musunga, Ngāti Tama ho, uh, hoki ngā iwi. Uh, tēnā tātou. Kia ora, everyone. <laughs> How's everyone feeling? <laughs> Good? Ready to kick off? I'm Janine, um, alongside the sister here, Tori. Uh, we're going to do our very best job to step into the shoes of Te Maire Tau. <laughs> <laughs> Much prettier, I'm sure. Uh, well, some of us. Um, but before we do kick off, there are a few things that we just need to get through. Uh, housekeeping, uh, first of all. So, um, always starting at the top or the bottom, perhaps. Uh, whare paku, uh, are just outside the room here, uh, to the left and to the left, your left, and to the right. Um, if you hear the fire alarm, please just follow. We've got a whole lot of UC staff here. Uh, if you want to put your hand up, we've got some directors of traffic. Uh, follow them. Stay in a group. Um, I'm sure the majority of the Māori in the room know what it's like to stay in a group. So follow, like kaihaka, out the door, um, stay together, and we'll be moving down towards uh, the kind of Arts Road, uh, Clyde Road car park. Um, and follow instructions, it's really important. <laughs> um, and if the ev evacuation is necessary, there, yeah, that assembly point is really important to know. So if you're not, I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm pointing in the right direction. I'm terrible with directions. So is that right? East? Yeah. yeah. Kia ora, Corbin. He had to give me a little wānanga beforehand. Um, additionally, um, if you're needing any support, um, particularly outside of this event, on your way, trying to find where you've parked your car, we have some UC help towers. So we have the Ngaitahu, uh, the Ngapaurewa a Ngaitahu and there, there's 13 help towers spread, to, spread throughout the campus, so you'll be able to find your way. They're lit up, they've got beautiful pictures on them, stop and read them, some beautiful narratives <laughs> on your way out of uh, Te Whareuanung or Waitaha, um, but you can call, call UC security if you need to. Tēnā tātou. I'm just going to hold it. Uh, kia ora e hoa mā, um, nau mai hari mai ki Te Whareuanunga o Waitaha. Um, e ngā mana whenua, nai tu a huriri, uh, tēnā koutou. Um, ko Tori McNow toku ingoa, um, ko Tarawera te maunga, ko Nungatahe te awa, ko, te aroa, uh, ko Aroa te waka, ko Te Aroa te iwi, um, no Rotorua a hau. Um, ko um, Aaron, that I ko Amanda, o ku mātua. Um, What's my role? I've forgotten. I'm the president. Tu muaki. Um, tu muaki um, at Te Rupu Aikonga o Te Whariwananga o Waitaha. Um, nā mahi ki a koutou katoa. Um, so kia ora everyone. My name is Tori McNow. Um, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure to be here um, amongst some pretty powerful um, people to say the least, people, that's what we are. Um, my job here tonight is alongside um, Janine to be the kai whakapauho or the, um, the MC, the moderator, whatever you want to call it, um, and empower these beautiful people beside me um, to um, give some all um, about some pretty heavy topics. So I think the first thing I want to acknowledge tonight is well done for walking through the door. Um, it, it's on the face of it pretty, um, pretty confronting um, and thank you for being here um, and secondly to let you know we're going to pop over to our panellists um, in a minute but before that we wanted to um, frame, frame this corridor with um, a bit of a video um, and I'm just going to leave it at that and we'll, we'll talk after it. that uh, you have the privilege of blaming people of color 
for their own victimization under white supremacy. I've heard you say that to me. I've heard you say that to him. I've heard you say that to him. I've heard you say it to him. I've heard you say it to uh, every person of color in the room who challenged your perception of yourself in the world. That is part of what it means. Why? Maybe that's part of the answer. That we feel that the field is wide open. That each man can stand on his own. No, no. We, yeah, each man does not stand on his own. Some men stand on other men and other women. Light-skinned men. Men from Europe stand on the heads and the hearts of men and women and children of color. That is, and of course, you, know, you also stand on the, uh, the, the heads of white women. But no, it's not a question of every man standing on his own ground. All of the ground down there of this planet has been taken from almost all of the people of color on this planet. Australia was a black continent. Africa was a black continent. North America was a red continent. South America was a red continent. You are not standing on your own ground. You're standing on red ground. And that's what it means to be white. To say that you're standing on your own ground and standing on somebody else's. And then mystify the whole process so it seems like you're not So, as you can see, we thought we'd start right at the top. <laughs> and I guess that's part of it for us too. We've all walked through the door. We've all, we've all come here to contribute to this discussion. And ooh, ooh, YouTube still we didn't mean to go twice. And part of the contributing to the conversation is, you know, it, it can be comfortable for some and really uncomfortable for others. And I guess that's probably one of the main reasons why we wanted to begin with that. Um, and on that note, we're going to lead in with our panellists. And, and what we're asking is, uh, you know, for you to introduce yourselves. Um, and, you know, what, what is it that you're contributing to this conversation tonight and what do you hope our audience will take away with them? Ao a tuatahi a tena rakui a tuatahi ki te mihi ki a kui a Corbin i tīmata te kōrero o te pōni a te mana o ngai tuahuriri te hukainga ki kuni a tena kui tena kui tu um, he pahi o te ru o te waka arai tūru a koto koko fari a koto matia koto koko fino a koro pa para ki te rāni a tai atu ki pipa karatu ne re re ne te tai o te ako i mihi atu ki a koto koko toe nga wai tapu. I rere ana te noko o te whenua, o kutua kana, kutua hine, ngā rangatera o te pō, ngā mihi, ngā mihi, no mai, no mai, haere mai. Um, that was a bit of a punch in the face with intention really, um, very much the, the, for those of you that may have watched the Fear of Colour documentary, it is about confronting racism and it is a documentary premised on a group of men um, talking about racism. And the reason that um, I suggested we watch that is because somewhere in that conversation there is a statement that um, the resolution of pain and pain for racism is actually in the pain. But in order to have pain is to have the conversation. And as is highlighted in that video, tonight's intention is not to be as confrontational as that, but to talk about and highlight the depth of the issues in the conversation itself. In that case, um, and that um, choice that I suggested was because partly Black Lives Matter has given rise to that issue. And that is very much about black and white. But it could equally be about faith, sex, well, not sex, because that's a bit rude. Um, <coughs> it could be about um, interfaith, intersectional issues. It could be about any prejudice, gender, ethnicity, or otherwise. And the issues that it raise is about self-reflection. For those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Darren Russell, and I have the privilege of working here at the University of Canterbury. Um, I'm not a big fan of titles, but um, I have one, and it is the Assistant Vice-Chancellor of Māori, Pacific and Equity here at the institution. 
Um, I had some questions that I needed to ask about why I'm here. Um, You're contributing. Um, why am I contributing? Um, obviously good looks, um, <laughs> talent, and if you give me a microphone, usually I sing. Um, that's, 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 the that's the stereotypical way that's, you know, that you might presume me as. Um, I'm probably hoping that this initiates that challenging conversation. If anything, from my perspective, the ownership of these issues is not mine. It's yours. And it's ours. And it's particularly those who have chosen not to be here. And the challenge of how we confront those who choose not to be here or have an alternative view to openness is the fundamental issue about why we're here in the first place. So, Alongside my esteemed peers, it is a pleasure to see you all here. Um, I hope that um, tonight's conference—that that tonight's, I was going to say conference, but more dialogue tonight—is somewhat unsettling. Not unsettling in the sense of yourself, but unsettling in the sense of how we disrupt the problem we have. And the problem we have is systematic, it is penetrated in our community, it is political, and it is almost in every hour of every day the way you think, the way you are taught to think. I was always taken by Martin Luther King who said, um, you know, the ultimate measure of a person, or I would argue community, is not where you stand when things are convenient and comfortable, but where you choose to stand when they are not. And you have chosen to be here because they are not. Black Lives Matter is because they are not. And it is not about Black Lives Matter in Aotearoa, but the underpinnings of racism that it confronts is as prevalent here as it is in America. So welcome to the conversation. It is a delight to see so many faces still smiling. No one's left yet, that's a good start. Um, but I do very much look forward not just to talking, but also to hearing and hopefully responding to questions that people feel comfortable to ask. And let me just say that if you want to ask, please do, because if you don't ask, there won't ever be an answer. So kia ora, everybody. Lovely to see you. Hold on. Hold on. Um, mana whenua, he mihi nunui ki a koutou, kaitahu, ka te maimoe, waitau huki, tēnā koutou, nā e tuoi huriri, tēnā koutou. Um, it's hard for me to do my mihis always because people say just start in your own language and I am not fluent in my own language so I always feel very odd when I'm asked to speak in something that's supposed to be mine and it's not so I often feel for people as they work their way through something that was taken and mine wasn't taken in the same way. I think people experience language loss here. I'm the child of political immigrants and an accidental German. So I, <laughs> I am an accidental German because my parents were in Germany when they could seek asylum. It is an absolute accidental nature for me to have that passport. So I am, why am I here and what can I contribute? I used to think I was always the best looking person on a panel, but clearly it goes to Darren tonight. Um, <laughs> we can put it to a vote. <laughs> so so um, I am a lecturer in the School of Educational Studies and Leadership in the College of Education, Health and Human Development. It's a long title and I have to practice every time so I don't forget parts of it. Um, I hold a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies and I wrote a dissertation on racism. So I have very strong feelings when people question my expertise on it. I had an expertise in racism before I wrote a dissertation <laughs> about it, but I felt having a dissertation and a PhD helped me get some credibility. So. I think I come to this space slightly differently because I wasn't always an academic. I don't come from an academic background per se. And I didn't gain most of the knowledge that I have in the university, even though I gained some of it in the university. 
So I'll do a whakapapa, not of where my people are from, but where the people are, who the people are who made me think the way I think about this particular conversation. So I read a fantastic scholar called Edward Said, and I read a book called Orientalism, and it really shifted how I thought about myself as a person who was from the Middle East. Um, I read Malcolm X's biography, autobiography, when I was 18 years old. I went to university and came across African philosophers that were taught in school in these niche pockets. And then I found through Afro-German activists amazing African-American scholars like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde. So we found the ways to e analyze our own existence through these different ways. And then I read a fantastic book when I was in university called Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda Tui Y. Smith. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to go to this country, and the university is going to be different. Um, <laughs> so these are just a few people who have shaped how I think. And it wasn't until later that I picked up books like you know, Black Skin, White Mass, The Wretched of the Earth, and particularly The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, I wish somebody had given me when I was 16 years old. So I come to these conversations with an academic hat, but also with this understanding that a lot of us come to these conversations in different spaces and different times through different people. I have been involved in anti-racist work since I was 17, 18 years old. I'm 37 now, so it's 20 years for me. So I have moments where I am done where I think this is it, that I'm not quite sure we are going anywhere with these conversations. So I'm here because I want these conversations <laughs> to make a difference, but I'm also here with this, you know, this bitterness that comes with it because you reach a point where you ask yourself how much of this that I am putting in there is actually going to impact on how I can live this life because this is a confronting how many minutes this was that we watch and it is very confronting to all of us um, but it's a very confronting existence day in and day out so um, this is I think the note that I want to, to end on is that we keep in mind that whatever happens in this room is a conversation that happens somewhere else after we leave this room is a conversation that happens somewhere when people are at home. It's a conversation that happens when you turn on the TV. It's a conversation that happens when you show up at work. Um, so some of us don't have the privilege to go to a place for an hour and a half and think about it and then not think about it for the rest of the day. So keep that in mind as I ask you for generosity for this space and for people who share their insights in this space. Tēnā noho ki tātou katoa, tēnī i mihi kaua ke rā ki a koto nai tahu, ki a nai tuahuru riri, nau kotoa no tēnī wahangi i whakatū whiratia mai mā tātou katoa nō rira tēnā koe. O tira ki nga kai whakapao ho te pōne i tēnā kūrua. So, my name is Garrett Cooper. I'm a senior lecturer in Aotearoa School of Māori Studies. Um, what Madisa and I share is the very first book that I ever read was Malcolm X's autobiography. That was the very first book. I remember where I was when I read it. I was sitting on a wharf uh, in Auckland. I used to work on unloading ships and we used to have a little bit of downtime and I used to sit in the shed and read and that was the very first book I've ever read in my life, which is quite an achievement because up until that point I hadn't read one book. So I was about 19 or 20 at the time. But um, one of the things that I've noticed in this country, and I'm sure many of you uh, share this observation, is that there's a real reluctance to talk about race and racism mm -hmm. in this country. Um, for whatever reason, we're uncomfortable, wish to put our heads in the sand, we just don't want to go there. And when I say us, I mean us for not just Pākehā and immigrants in this country, but all new, newly, um, new New Zealanders, new Kiwis, new Aotearoans, whatever you like to term it, um, also Māori. We've uh, been quite reluctant in talking about racism in this country. For whatever reason, we've placed our eggs in the basket of the Treaty of Waitangi and hoped that that would fix everything up. 
And my, um, it's not that I'm criticizing the efforts in terms of having the treaty um, have much greater visibility in our lives, but rather as a consequence of that, perhaps unintended, um, we've forgotten about the actual uh, daily realities of racism in this country. I'll talk a little bit more later on about the sort of distinctions between interpersonal acts or, or racist acts, um, which is something, to some extent, uh, most, civilized, uh, most countries have been um, able to successfully address. There will be all sorts of um, incidences, of course, but generally speaking, uh, if one of us sees an act of racism out in the street, we'll intervene. Systemic racism, though, is quite a different matter and there's been a real unwillingness to address that. Um, so just in terms of my genealogy, uh, intellectual genealogy, I share uh, Franz Fanon. Uh, he's one of the first scholars that I've read at length that talks about race and colonialism. <laughs> You've got competition. Well done. <laughs> I, I'm not sure who spoke more eloquently. <laughs> Um, so it's through the work largely of Franz Fanon, um, who, if you haven't read his work, um, I would really recommend. Um, Richard of the Earth is um, certainly one of his uh, most well-known, but Black Skin, White Masks is another one, uh, which is particularly pertinent to this conversation this evening. Now, um, just platforming off and just to make a connection with blackness. So, and this will be my last sort of introductory comment. So. We can support the BLM movement in the, in the US and Māori, Pacifica, uh, immigrant communities to this country have long been supporters of um, black civil rights and movements and been inspired by those movements overseas. So we can support them, but it also becomes a catalyst for more local conversations and that's why we're here, I'm guessing, today. But this term blackness, um, we most often think of it in terms of the African diaspora, and, and um, that's a term which is widely understood as such, and I'm not denying that at all. But what I would add to that is that blackness is also something which is arises in context in relation to whiteness. And so there are all sorts of blackness right throughout the world, and it has its own local variation. So the guy in the um, documentary talked about red, but you would talk with Native Americans and they would talk about blackness as well. They will pick up this term red people. Um, but what they're actually talking about is the same relationship with white people as people of the African diaspora. There are sort of regional variations and little differences, but largely it's a very similar type of relationship. And finally, I don't think it's helpful to have an oppression Olympics. Um, and that is to sort of have a competition about whose oppression is greater than another. We can support each other without having a competition. And um, I think those are real diversions from the really important issues around the different forms of oppression, uh, racial oppression right throughout the world. So that's my introductory comments. Uh, kia ora e um, I just, I'm blown away by all of you. Um, I've learnt things that I didn't know about any of you, um, just then, and felt myself in a way um, kind of relate to you. But I'm going to go off script a little bit. Go for it, Phil. Um, and I'm going to, if, if we're going to have a really honest conversation here, I want to start that off with including everyone in this room in that. So who, who in this room, just pop your hand up if you identify as a person of colour. Wonderful. Cool. Awesome. Same. Um, who in this room is under the age of 25? Oh, no. <laughs> Self-identified? Yeah, no. self oh, don't worry if you're over the age of 25, I won't make you put your hand up. Um, who, who in this room um, identifies as part of the queer community? Cool. Who in this room has a university degree? Wow. Wow, some that don't know. It's, yeah. Uh, who in this room um, can own that they've experienced some kind of privilege in their life? Awesome. That was really beautiful. Awesome. Eh? Um, cool. Um, 
And you, I think the point of me doing that was actually I wanted to end with you're all welcome here. Um, and I want you to all feel part of this conversation because all of those topics, all of those areas and more um, are going to come up as part of this. But I, I think the first thing we probably need to unpack, particularly from our panel, panellists' point of view, is um, this thing called Black Lives Matter. Um, it's going around. We often see it on social media. It's talked about as a movement. Sometimes it's talked about as a, as a social conscience. Mm -hmm. Social um, uprising. Yeah, all of the above. What is it? What is it to you? Um, and what does it mean in the context of Aotearoa? I said I wouldn't have notes, and these two said that they wouldn't have notes, and then they both had notes, and then I freaked out. Um, so um, maybe to just contextualize a little bit, I think there have been different iterations of movements in, this, in support of black lives that weren't necessarily called Black Lives Matter. But when we talk Black Lives Matter, we think, you know, 2013, like the hashtag, and and what we now define as the BLM movement. But it's really important to, to, to understand that that is just one iteration of, in the United States context, black people um, speaking up and defending and denouncing systematic inequality and black death in the United States. And I think there have been different variations of that in different contexts too. So when Black Lives Matter moved into different places with that term, it doesn't come as something that is only tied to the United States. I think it travels as a form of solidarity, um, but it also travels because the machineries of black death, as, as I call it, so it's systems that create vulnerabilities for people that take years of their life, that take their health, that take their access to education, um, for people categorized as black actually exists around the globe. So in the German context, there were different movements that had different names, but then with the resurgence of that hashtag became part of a bigger movement. And I think it speaks to so many people because racism is an issue to so many people. So I think there is, yes, there is this very central conversation that ties the birth of this movement to the United States and started by black women in particular, um, queer black women. Um, but then somehow people have also ownership of it because it doesn't necessarily try to keep it within the national borders of that country. So I think that's, that's how I understand it. I think I want to expand a little bit of what we mean when we say you know, black lives matter. I do see an important point of what Garrick was saying is that this, this is about how terms acquire meaning and the values we attach to those terms. And it's true that blackness and whiteness, like those are black becomes real in relationship to something that it distinguishes itself from. Um, but I also think that there is an importance to, to highlight why we say black lives matter because black lives have to matter, not only within the context of white supremacy in the United States, but because we reproduce anti-blackness in non-black communities too. So I think that's where this, this tension arises between blackness as a political term and blackness as a political consciousness, which is really important, I think, for movement building, um, but also understanding blackness as a material reality that comes attached to what you are seen as in the world, mm. not only in white communities, because we can reproduce white supremacy um, by people who don't necessarily benefit of it, right? Like within Middle Eastern communities or other Asian communities. So I think those are some of those tensions that we all have to work through. Mm. So I think it's national, globalized, we all hold on to it because it means something to the conversations mm -hmm we want to have, and sometimes it makes it easier for us to have those conversations mm -hmm. when something as horrific um, as footage of a, of a man dying on camera reaches us, mm -hmm. which is kind of sad if you realize like, it takes that for us to understand that we need to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I sort of addressed that in my sort of open, opening remarks, but I do want to share just a quick um, sort of anecdote. So today, Medisa and I um, had a quick conversation for about two and a half hours. Um, <laughs> that's quick, that's and, quick for you guys. And during the conversation, one of the things that um, Matisse uh, pointed out was that the influence of uh, black popular culture beyond the borders of the US has been significant and sort of argued that a lot of us engage with America through black popular culture. And it made me think about my own experiences, not necessarily black popular culture, but my first sort of interaction with my mother when she raised the issues of racism that is perpetrated upon African Americans. And I was about six or seven at the time. And um, we were watching Muhammad Ali fight on a um, Saturday afternoon, which was the time they used to show them. And um, my mother would talk about Muhammad Ali and um, the racism which African Americans experienced. And I was about six or seven. I remember the conversation vividly as a young, um, young child at the time. And that was the sort of first interaction with that. Um, so yes, definitely through um, the influence of American TV, American popular culture, mm -hmm. and it's um, spread beyond its own borders mm -hmm. influence. Kilda. It's, it's an interesting question. I, I, Black Lives Matter is easy to third party. So I think in Aotearoa or globally beyond the, the boundaries of the United States, it's a very easy thing to third party as a distasteful, extreme sense of racism. But sadly, um, the reason it gets traction beyond the American borders is not because of the action, but because, I think, vast populations who are not the majority, who are the other, whether they be colour of skin, ethnicity, all of those isms that you can sort of name, suffer that on a daily basis. And part of the challenge... Um, for us, I think, is we can often sit back in Aotearoa and say, aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky we don't suffer the more overt racism in Australia, the, um, the killing of George Floyd? Um, but actually, every day on the doorstep of this university, this city, this island and this nation, the same thing happens to cohorts of our community and those that are shocked by Black Lives Matter don't see it within our own. And I think Black Lives Matter first, um, for me anyway, and this is my story, um, really raised its head after the, the tragedy of the 15th of March last year and no one needs to be reminded of the extremism, the sadness, shock, and otherwise of that event. But for me and my team, and, and a number in my community, the shock that was more apparent amongst us was the commentary that they are us. Because on a goddamn daily basis, that shit happens to me and my team with less extremism, less overtness, and less tragedy, but in exactly the same way. And the community that desires to express it, which in part is about empathy of the circumstance, which I would argue we all share, is completely missed by the same audience. And I think Black Lives Matter because in part we pick from it what it is we don't want to be, but we fail to reflect in how we don't contribute to it. And I think, for me, that's probably the biggest issue, mm. Tori, if that's, if that's an opening gambit of the question. Mm. Um, and I do think we are lucky in Aotearoa. We could have had a very different trajectory and journey as an Indigenous population, mm. but the fundamental issues remain, I think, confronting in our, in our nation. Mm. So, 
and listening to that too. So in reflection as well around Black Lives Matter and thinking about, uh, not necessarily an argument, but, an, but a, another conversation around all lives matter. You know, what's the difference? And, you know, or why are we not thinking about all as opposed to just the one? Bugger holding on to this. Um, <laughs> it's very similar to the Black Lives Matter. It allows us to opt out of our contribution to mm. racism. Yep. That's fundamentally the issue. Um, I believe that we all want the same outcome, generally as a community. I think there are extremes where people don't want that outcome, but... I generally don't think that people wake up to think they are going to do harm, disadvantage or create inequality in the world, mm -hmm. however they may contribute to that. Mm -hmm. But sadly, systematically and certainly politically, we don't achieve that outcome and we don't, we don't confront that issue. So I think... Um, the irony for me in that question, Janine, is not about that all lives don't matter. If I think about how lives matter, I work in an institution <laughs> premised on a British colonial system that was the framing of colonisation that um, caused significant damage to the world's populations of indigenous populations. But I work in here because all lives do matter. And my interest in challenging the advantaged or the inequality for those disadvantaged is because all lives should matter. And Ida, Ida Hapati Ramsden is a classic example of a, of a ngaitahu wahini rangatira, a woman of eminence who um, and died not, not long after completing her thesis, not that a university has anything to do with credibility. I, I share that sentiment. Mm. But come to the University of Canterbury. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was also the architect of cultural safety yeah. in nursing. And that development was to provide a lens to ensure that all nurses were competent to deliver good outcomes for all patients in the community. It wasn't about va validating a Māori sense of knowledge. And in the end, um, uh, you know, mm. the animus of white politics, it's prejudiced. It is about ill will. It is about policy, process and power. And it leverages racism to disadvantage parts of our community. And if any of you have a doubt that that's the case, then think and look because media will not be your source. But Ida Harpati's comment and development was, what is to fear from an indigenous population being healthy? And that was the systematic issue that she was endeavouring to confront. Mm. It wasn't about advantaging Māori, black, female, I could name anything. It was about getting equality of service for all people that nurses engage with. And it's an example, I think, of how we give into the space, but the reciprocity often isn't returned. Mm -hmm. um, my answer is slightly different. Cause because it can I, be. I, 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 I think this is also really good to see multiplicity of approach and that just because we stand here to talk about anti-racism, that our anti-racism looks the same. I think fundamentally the issue with All Lives Matter is a dislocation from where the problem is. Somebody once said to me, sexism, the worst thing about sexism and why it works so well is that it keeps you from doing your job. Mm -hmm. It keeps you from getting done what you're supposed to do by keeping you busy with all the stuff that you have to deal with because you are not taken seriously as a woman. And I actually think, you know, oppression works like that. So All Lives Matter sounds good in theory, but what All Lives Matter does, what its effect is in the conversation, is that you stop looking at what we're thinking about. So if it's police brutality, if it's the 
killing of innocent people at the hands of the police, or if it's you know the c criminal justice system and the overrepresentation of certain populations in prison, it stops it. And then we have to go back and say, but we really do care about everybody. Um, and yes, of course, we want everybody to thrive, which we do. So I said, it's when we do that, what happens to the conversation? Hmm. Because its job is to take your attention and put your attention from where it was to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem that I see with All Lives Matter is not just that we are demonstrating that actually we are striving towards all lives to matter. That sentence doesn't want all lives to matter. That sentence wants you to get distracted and put your conversation somewhere else. And I think what that conversation also does is one of the biggest problems with conversations on racism is that we always start from scratch. Every single time. So conversations that now are public in the media, particularly around protests that were organized across this country too, but other countries as well, was that journalists would ask, is this country, insert country name, is this country racist? So every conversation starts from us saying, oh, actually, yes, it is, and here's why. And then you move on to the next conversation and you start again from zero. We can't really progress because every time we speak up, we're put back to the place where we have to point out that the problem is real. Um, mm. So I think it isn't so much about what the sentence think it says. The problem with the statement is what it does. So this is a good opportunity for me to sort of slightly segue into sort of my comments around um, systemic racism. But just in relation to the, um, the all lives matter thing, I think it's a denial of reality. I would, um, and that, that reality is that up until now, black lives haven't mattered. And to say that all lives matter is an opportunity for us to look away from the obvious and that up until now, until we've had these movements which have been going along for, uh, going around for a long time, this, this is not no recent phenomenon, um, but up until now people haven't listened. Um, just in relation to systemic racism, um, and I, I connected to what Darren was talking about in terms of uh, Eddie Harpity Ramsden's work, and I sort of, uh, for those of you that know me, I'm slightly critical <laughs> of um, cultural competence and the sort of uh, what I call in my work cultural thesis, which is the idea that if we just put a little bit more culture in things, everything's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've been a little bit cheeky in how I um, characterise it, um, but I, I don't agree with that. And sort of the Māori engagement with the system is to presume that the system is good. It's just not delivering for us right now. And if we just all jump in and um, pick up a spade and a shovel and help out, we'll, we'll turn it around and everything will be back on and rosy. But, um, but I don't believe that's the case at all. I don't think the statistics which we're all aware of are aberrations. My sort of suspicion, and it's a very strong one, which makes it into a belief perhaps, um, is that the system is working as it intended to. So, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Just in relation to the language we use to describe the, the social indices, we talk about the over-representation of Māori in these statistics and uh, Pacifica uh, folk as well in these statistics as if there's a bias, right? So the system didn't intend to uh, treat these people of colour differently. Um, there's a bias, we just need to you know, pick our shovels up and away we go and it's going to be all good. But if we use the language of bias, um, that is to think of the system as inherently good. But what if your bias is actually a norm? And we've got lots of evidence to suggest that it's no longer a bias and it's a norm. And if it's a norm, then that's, then that's the system working as it intended to. Mm -hmm. And it's a denial of reality to say that the system is not doing that. Mm -hmm. And the sort of all lives matter um, moniker is an attempt to deny reality and history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some really, really, oh, Marty. 
Did you want to? Um, yes. Um, so there's a fantastic Jamaican philosopher who writes precisely about that, this, this notion of self-deception. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that we have currently with racism in all the countries I've lived in, and I've lived in a few, is racism is treated as an aberration from the norm. Mm -hmm. It is treated as an exception. Right? It happens usually in the fringes, and we know who is in the fringes, and it's assigned to supposedly uneducated lower classes. Um, as if somehow, if you worked your way up to university, you would escape racism. Um, good luck. Um, so I think when we look at people who've written from different points of, in different points in time about racism, the ones that kind of we come back to, we keep coming back to, are people who understand that the system, that this is a systemic issue. It's not a behavioral issue. So my students just you know, heard that today in class. Bias is fundamentally something at the individual level. If an, if an institution responds to the problem of racism by talking about bias, it doesn't want to talk about the systemic outcome. It wants to talk about individual people making bad intentional choices. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of couples racism with intent. And, right, and we need to untangle racism from intent. And, talk about racism as attached to impact. So the impact of it is what matters, not your intention. There are probably a few people who intend to be racist, mm -hmm. but these days you'd be very hard pressed to find somebody mm -hmm. who would self-identify as a racist. Mm -hmm. Very, very hard pressed, you know? Like, it's almost the worst thing you can call somebody. So we know now, that we can't get people to agree that they intended to do it, and if we focus on intent, we miss or the impact that actually happens in society. So Charles Mills actually coins, he calls it, he calls the term epistemic ignorance, so that people don't see from where they act and from where they are operating. But he says it's not an ignorance, like you as a person who's not medically trained might be ignorant about cancer. He says, you know, sometimes you go to the doctor and they just know more because they've been trained. This is not that kind of ignorance. It's the ignorance that comes with every knowledge you were given had to create ignorance about something else. It had to create a silence about something else that you didn't learn. So he says, you're kind of in, in this constant state of self-deception, because at this point in time, after, you know, in, in the case of in North America, 500 years of colonization, there have been 500 iterations, like 500 years of iteration of somebody saying, hey, this isn't really great. Um, but we still, think that the system is working. So he says that there's an active process in which we choose to ignore the information that is presented to us. So when I say we choose to ignore, I'm not saying that you choose to ignore that racism is real, but people choose to ignore, to recognize that it's built within the fabric of our society. Mm -hmm. So that actually the norm is we are all existing in a place that's racist, and the exception is when we collectively choose to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to, to add, Darren? Yeah, Can mm -hmm. I jump in just quickly? Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that I suppose really does interest me, probably because, well, all of us, we're all here at this institution, we're, it, me, us four especially, and, and Tori, both as, we've been students, but also we work here, we work in the system. So, and kind of looking up to my left there, and I'm looking at things like bicultural competence and confidence, I'm listening to, to Garrett talk about cultural competence and its role what is the role of our institution then, or not necessarily this one on its own, but the uh, educational institutions and in unpacking some of this stuff, yeah. addressing it? Um, it's hot in your hand. I think I think it's yeah, yeah I'm like yay. <laughs> I, I guess what I'm asking is why are you here? Like why why do we all take the job that we've got? Mm. I think the problem for me is I'm like where do I go? Um, <laughs> Well, I've got a um, you know, I would love to just um, grow my own food, um, but I also am a very urban creature, so I don't know if I would survive off the grid. Um, I think the, the university is a particular beast, because the university has been complicit in some of the most atrocious crimes committed against people mm -hmm. um, who are colonized people, and the knowledge production from the institution of the, like, the institution the university um, has been used to justify the, the exploitation um, 
and oppression of other people, but it's also been a place where we can come and think through some of those ideas. And I'm conflicted, you know, I, th I don't know if there is a job where I would be, that wouldn't have some of the same problems, but I do think that the university has always had that job to talk back to society. Mm -hmm. Even if it didn't do so, supporting mm -hmm. indigenous people or black people or people of color, but it always had the job of reflecting back to society and, and having conversations that were maybe not with the norm. So I think in that sense, we have a responsibility. Um, I also think it makes it easier for us to go through and finish university if the, if the institution reflects us back. I can count, I mean, I can not only on one hand, I had two professors of color when I went to university and one, was, one of them was adjunct. Um, which mm. here would mean, what is that, when you're like contracted. Um, so you don't have a permanent position, so you, you know, it's, you're more precarious. Um, and it didn't necessarily talk about all the things that were important to me. So when I went to the United States and I had about 20% students of color, and they you know, complained of how much racism there was in the university and how much we needed to do, I did have moments where I thought, yes, but we have, we have come like there has been progress in some of these ways. And I said, you know, you have to understand that this is big. You at least have each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you have each other and that's really, really important. Um, and Sarah Ahmed says institutions are designed to keep us out, right? Like you walk, who are the people on those paintings? Who sits in these institutions? And they adapt towards you. And I know that this institution doesn't necessarily feel the same way to me as it feels to some of my colleagues, and that's okay. Um, but it doesn't mean just because I am at odds with the walls of this institution um, that the solution would meet for me to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there, there is this part that is, that is hopeful in me that says, yes, chip, chip, away, chip, chip. Um, and then there's this other part that's like, no, oh, when? Um, so I think it's, there's multiple le levels in which we are active and Normalization is important. It makes it easier for other people to succeed. And it makes it for them, like they, you can look at somebody and say, well, I can be in that position. But if you can never see points of reference for yourself, mm -hmm. it's really hard to imagine aspirations. Mm -hmm. So what I was saying to Garrick earlier in our brief chat um, was that the reason why we can emphasize with the black struggle in the United States was because for many of us brown people, African-American culture was what we first saw on TV before we saw people like, that were part of our own group, okay? I watched religiously the Cosby show when I was young, okay? I watched The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and I identified with those people. They weren't part of my ethnic group. I'd, I'd never been to America. But there was something about that experience because that was, you know, I could see somebody who was a doctor or a lawyer who lived in a mansion in LA. While people who looked like me on German television only sold groceries, right? So that's what society told me I could be, while this other culture that came out of the United States was giving me a different image. And I think that's why until today, so much of what happens in America is easy for us to, to respond to because it's a universalized experience at this point for many of us. So what role can the university play in this? So, um, I mean, absolutely, as a critic and conscience of society, um, universities need to be picking up the difficult issues and providing spaces for these conversations to be had, um, not necessarily providing answers. So um, for students of mine, um, I'm really good at raising questions and unsettling things, but I'm not really good at giving them answers. And, and actually, um, sometimes that's intended, it's their job to work it out, and I guess this conversation itself is an opportunity for us to think about this, um, these, um, these issues and try to work through them ourselves. Mm. Now I understand um, that there are sort of particular forces at play within the institution that were uncomfortable with us having this conversation this evening. And um, I mean, I think as an institution we need to be on the front foot on these issues 
and taking them out and providing for a light these to have these difficult conversations for far too long, as I said before, in this country we've stuck our head in the sand with regards to racism and we can no longer do that. And the BLM movement has reminded mm. us that we can't do that any longer. Mm. And if you need any more reminding, just read those social indices and go and spend some time with the people that are doing it hard within our communities because mm. it's tough out there. Um, we as Indigenous scholars within the institution need to remember that we're very privileged and whilst these institutions might um, teach knowledges that we have issues with, um, we're given space within the institution to ask those difficult questions, to challenge our colleagues. And I've done this with um, some sociologists in the newspaper from colleagues from this institution. I've challenged them. But that's our role and that's the opportunities that universities have to play mm -hmm. in this particular issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the, the critic and conscience, I think I, I'd share Garrick's view. Uh, there, is a, there is a freedom, and, and I'll talk about myself as Ngaitahu. So, you know, well, I'm actually, I'm not Ngaitahu. I, I hail, so this is my theory of not telling you much about myself is because I'm going to try and tell some stories, but I'm a really shit storyteller, so I don't think I'll share too many. But I hail from a small place called Otako, and I am, by culturally, by default, the, the son of a father who was from Otako and a mother who was from English, biculturalism, voila, just like that. Um, <laughs> and my challenge with um, biculturalism or identity was from birth till now. Mm. And if some, some of you may think, well, you know, of course you're challenged by the institution of this nature. Christ, I'm more challenged by my mother on a daily basis <laughs> um, in the sense that racism or perhaps non-awareness of critical issues associated with racism come from her mouth at astonishing rates. Uh, look, I and I love her to pieces. But when she says, well, what gives the rights for Maoris to have water? It's like, did I really come out of you? Um, <laughs> From her waters, actually. But, but from her waters, yes, yeah. Janine. Um, Just saying. But I, but I absolutely um, adore her because between her and my father, the imperatives of Māori values in the care for those who were disadvantaged was an underpinning that wasn't overt as a cultural act or a native act. It was part of what we saw ourselves in a wider um, collective a wider sense of well-being. Um, why the university? Look, I do think that critic and conscience, rightfully um, pointed out, is part of the freedom to challenge the animus that creates our society, whether that's existing, um, whether that's new, or whether that's about trying to disrupt some of those fundamental issues that we've been talking about tonight. Um, for me, it's about if we are to create and play in a medium to long term game in Aotearoa, the validation of Indigenous knowledge and all knowledges that is non hierarchical, power based, and privileged to white validation in science is something that we bring as a contribute to all of our graduates. Mm -hmm. So, for me, knowledge validation is huge. And the role we can play, albeit in an institution of limited power that we exercise, um, is still one that um, I think is, is fundamental to societal change. Research to engage in the way we think and to validate that teaching is huge. And the critic and uh, conscience piece for me personally is not just about my challenges with the Crown, the state, the government, the institutions that create this, as I think about two decades of tribal development, I am critical and conscious that our tribe has become a subordinate to the same powers without intent. And the placation of guilt in a settlement to the Crown has created our own monster. 
and not a monster in necessarily a bad way. I'm not being critical of my own tribe. It's the reason I do the work I do. But the closer you get to the monster, the more the monster looks like you. And so part of my critical and conscience is very much about my own identity and what I believe it's for. Our tribe's belief in the capitalist theory and how much is enough in terms of creating an economy is a fundamental challenge that I think is not just for the Crown, it is also for ourselves. If I think about the struggle of eight generations to get a settlement and recognition of our identity um, and being fundamentally bankrupt in 1996 to now being a, a diminishing asset base of one point, sorry, COVID-19, um, <laughs> you know, 1.4 billion and almost $60,000 per head. That would have been more of our 60,000 members. That would have been more than generations had ever dreamed as being a capital worth. But is that the aim? The closer we get to it, the more we the more we become part of it. and it, So I, the critic in conscience for me is it, it, in terms of racism, in terms of development in our society, isn't just about the challenge of the government. It's also the challenge of ourselves yeah. and the freedom to do that. Mm. But the responsibility ain't mine. No. You know, although I lead some highly talented, much more clever people than myself in the team... <laughs> Not those two. Um, oh, I was going to swear with my yeah. hands. Um, the, the challenge is about ensuring that um, my peers and so many in the audience that I look around and know lead that championing for us are the change champions more than me. Mm. And the more we can empower that, the less contribution and more ability to grow my own food and live out the back um, <laughs> is likely. Yeah. And I think like what you're highlighting here is this, when you're talking about the sense of guilt and the sense of I don't belong here or I don't know my identity because I bridged two cultures, which is becoming more and more common in our societies, is this idea of imposter syndrome and that you walk into a space and this isn't, it's not yours but it's not anyone else's and sometimes I personally know I felt guilty because I have a family who sits at home and no one else made it to university and here I am and I feel like, do I deserve to be here? Should I go home? What should, like, what, what's, what's my role in this? In this? Um, and I guess with that, we as an executive um, quite often talk, um, quite often have discussions about um, what it's, I guess, like to confront people who don't know what, I guess, racism would look like or because it, it exists in such um, minute ways, you could say, in New Zealand or that you don't notice or it's so ingrained in our society. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you find yourself facing someone who's blatantly in your eyes being racist, um, but they don't know it and they won't listen to you. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to ask is, when, you, when you're trying to have that conversation with someone who's just not receptive to that, what do you do? And you may not know the answer to that, but um, yeah. I'll make mine brief. I usually get in a fetal position and cry. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they feel really bad and then I laugh. No. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh because that is the daily view. A a and one of the words that I put up there is on about utu, and often that's um, often classified or, 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 or translated, and I'm not a language expert, Corbin, so don't panic, um, <laughs> is as revenge, but it's more about the reciprocity perspective, and I think it's an excellent question. I think for a, for a, for a, lot, of our, a lot of my staff, part of our work in the reciprocity balance is to understand racism, mm -hmm. to understand our perspective as an indigenous team and the role we're carrying out in an institution of this nature. And, and I guess um, for me, part of the engagement and reciprocity is endeavouring to try and place our peace in the centre. We are really challenged sometimes in having that reciprocity come back at us. So. Um, I know Garrick hates my bicultural competence and confidence um, language because he just said it before and I'm trying not to cry. Um, <laughs> but because I often think bicultural competence and confidence is seen as the cultural bit. There's the native, they do these Maori things, they sing a song, they rub noses, they have cultural etiquette in certain ways. 
Cultural competence has absolutely nothing to do with that. It's about the self-reflection and acceptance and understanding of yourself mm -hmm. with somebody that has something different and operates in a different way. Mm -hmm. The problem that I have, and I think we're confronted, is that we go into a room understanding that basis, give, in, if you're thinking a 50-50 partnership, give 100% of ourselves into that space, maybe get some coming back, and that's unfair to homogenise, but to a greater extent we don't often get a 50-50 start. We hope to bring forward by giving more of the 100% and often don't get a response. And the moment we say this is a partnership, the moment we feel bad for challenging racism. Mm -hmm. So we end up in A, the discomfort of racism, mm -hmm. and then secondly, the challenge of racism becomes even worse for us. Yeah. And it's not our issue to even address. Yeah. And so there's part of me that, um, and it's the same in treaty education, people hear something and how are impassioned, and, and I do strongly encourage that you take that challenge. Treaty responsiveness, racism and otherwise is not my issue to address. Yeah. It's somebody else's. But I have to be the owner of challenging it. Mm. I have to understand it and be prepared to discuss it mm. and to be able to do so in a way that brings the person to the journey. Mm. And I think it's fair to say it is a very difficult situation to manage. Mm. And I think the only thing that I can strongly encourage is that if you don't put into the conversation, you are by default contributing to its acceptance. Yeah. And, and that is really hard with the likes of white fragility mm -hmm. as a term that is often used about when it is challenged, the natural defensiveness that I'm not racist, I've lived next door to a Maori. Um, I know a gay boy. Um, you can spin out any of the mm -hmm. issues that come with this. Because by nature, that's not the intention of the individual. But to be able to draw in the conversation about why that is challenging for them starts a journey for themselves. So I, I can only but encourage with warning about it is a very, very difficult path. Mm. And it's not always attainable that utopia is achieved. Mm. Uh, I won't be very long. Um, so one of my lines I like to use is some of my best friends are scientists. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's awesome. Uh, I just want to respond briefly to Darren's um, char characterization of my criticism. <laughs> um, you will be glad to know, um, Darren, I've softened my criticism. I do think there is a place for it, um, and I do see the value in it, uh, whilst the criticism still stands. <laughs> just in relation to the question about um, to white folk that are not ready, don't want to have that conversation, you can't force people to have conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not particularly interested in talking to people that don't want to talk about those things. Mm -hmm. But what I would add is that um, there's a really great book. Most people um, misconstrue Fanon's work as a critique of colonialism and racism and in that it speaks to the black experience and only the black experience. Fanon's book actually has a message for white people. And um, there's a really good book um, called uh, Fanon and the Crisis of the European Man, uh, written by, I think this, were we talking about Charles Mills or Lewis Gordon before, the Jamaican? Charles Mills, yeah, because they're both Jamaican. But Lewis Gordon wrote this book called Fanon and the Crisis of the European Man. And what um, Lewis does in that particular book is he takes, because uh, Fanon died at the age of 37, wrote four books before he died, um, but he takes Fanon's work further and it demonstrates in Fanon and the Crisis of the European Man how racism is actually dehumanizing not just for people of color, but for the white person. And it's, evasion, it's an evasion of their own humanity, he argues. And um, so there's a message in Fanon for everybody that we all come to the table and have those conversations, but we can't force people mm. to have that conversation if mm. they don't want to. Mm. That's really good. Um, 
So I do a lot of macro anti-racist work, so policy, institutional racism, and I do very little on interpersonal. And I think when we think about how do we make somebody who's just blatantly racist to our face, how much energy do you have that day? I think all of us know, we choose on a daily basis, when is it worthwhile saying something? And I think it's different disrupting it. I think what I heard Darren say was, we disrupt it by saying, oh, I don't agree with what you just said, or hmm. I think that's a bit offensive. Like, I do something like that, but I don't necessarily always engage. Because um, I should, I mean, if, if I did, I need, to, I need to, like, start billing people, you know? <laughs> PhD in racism, so if I educate you, I'm officially working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like Darren got a lot of jokes, like, yeah. and I need to like get some laughter. Um, <laughs> um, I kind of want to bring this about, like, to like what anti-racism is. Like, if we're talking about we can identify something that's racist, what does it mean to be anti-racist? And we need to understand that if we think racism is a structural issue, then not being racist isn't enough. Right? Being non-racist isn't enough. If racism is the very fabric of our society, not participating in overt racist crimes isn't enough. It's a bare minimum. Um, so what does it mean to be anti-racist? Um, and a scholar of mine that I really like says, if race is what brings risk to your life, and we, if we bring this back to Black Lives Matter in the United States, being a young black man walking in the street, because um, Trayvon Martin was walking home in the street wearing a hoodie and that was suspicious enough for him to lose his life um, is we have to understand that our existence is attached to risk it is attached to, to perpetual suspicion about whether or not we, we should walk down the street or whether or not the <coughs> car is ours um, so for us, existing carries a certain risk. So if we engage in challenging the state in particular, because we're talking about institutional racism, then that comes with a risk as well, like of police brutality, but it also comes at a risk of alienation, at um, losing friends and family. Like the act of engaging in anti-racist work verbally and practically comes with a risk. So for people who are not oppressed under racism, so people who benefit from racism, unless you're willing to take a risk, you're not actively participating in anti-racist work. So I ask my students always in class, and we haven't got to that point yet, so spoiler alert. So what are you willing to give up? And mind you, I'm not asking you for lunch back just yet. Um, I'm saying what on an individual level are you willing to give up? $10, $20, a friendship, calling out your uncle, a job, a position like in a, on a conference panel. What are you willing to give up? Because this is not a journey that's going to give you lots of rewards. I mean, I, we can't sugarcoat it. Obviously, this is something that it's, we should thrive towards. It's going to give you lots of good friends, too, because I think you make new friends in these movements. But fundamentally, what is the risk you're willing to take? If you think you can come into this and there won't be any risk, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you post something on Facebook, there's somebody who's going to be upset by what you posted. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to take that? Mm -hmm. And that's like just the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in a room and your best friend says something and you don't call that out, you know, or you do, what happens to that relationship? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for us, these relationships are constantly in question. So anti-racism to me is attached to really being able to take a risk because existing under white supremacy is a risk for people who are racialized because you never know and we're not talking and I think microaggressions are important because they really make your life very very hard but when we talk mm -hmm. about racism we're, we're talking about people losing you know dying seven to ten years younger than other people like this stuff kills people right and w what's the risk we're willing to take collectively mm -hmm. So I think I have an issue with white fragility because I think it's an important concept. You know, everybody now is reading white fragility. Who profits now? Everybody's reading white academics' work saying that you have fragility. Fragility is true. Like, we have fragility. We get uncomfortable. But if you talk about white fragility, we imagine white folks as these fragile, delicate beings that only if they understood 
to not be fragile, this problem would be resolved, and I don't think that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think if we want to talk about racism, we need to read the people who've been theorizing this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also about who capitalizes on this work now, um, who occupies spaces to talk about these issues. Those are ways in which we reproduce violence, and these are places where we reproduce vulnerabilities for people. Because there's money, like money is power too. So I think there's some conversations around where are we willing to put our money, and where are we willing to put our bodies? Are we willing, and I'm not asking you to stand in front of a tank, but um, you know, like think about what are you willing to give up? So I think that's something I always ask myself. And being a person of color in an indigenous land, I think that's also an important conversation. Because what does that mean for me in my relationship, particularly here? So what does it mean for me to say, Black Lives Matter, and I want to be anti-racist in Aotearoa? What does that mean for me in my relationships to Māori? Mm -hmm. okay? What am I willing to give up? Mm -hmm. What am I willing to fight for? What am I going to say to people you know, that I might alienate in that struggle? Right? 